I'm Lara Matosian, host of the Adjacent Possible podcast. The Adjacent Possible is a kind of shadow future, hovering on the edges of the present state of things, a map of all the ways in which the present can reinvent itself. This podcast is all about probing what's possible, what's probable, and what's preferable in education. Join us as we explore how we can overhaul our current pedagogical systems, solve global grand challenges, and bring about civilization-level change. The Adjacent Possible podcast is held in partnership with Area 2071, which is part of the Dubai Future Foundation. The Adjacent Possible podcast is also supported by Academy, a global educational organization that offers future-focused and wisdom-based education to high school learners with the aim of preparing them for a world of automation, artificial intelligence, and accelerating change. Our guest today is Dr. Majid Al-Qasimi. Welcome to the Adjacent Possible podcast. You join me, your host, Lara Matosian, and our guest, Dr. Majid Al-Qasimi. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Lara. It's so wonderful to have you. Let's start with finding out a bit about you. You are the Director of Animal Health and Development at the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment. Yep. Tell us some more about what your role entails. Um, well, other than it being one of the longest titles out there, um, <laughs> I'm in charge of animal health for the country. Um, I over see and regulate uh, live animal trade, as well as the veterinary practice in the country, uh, and the epidemiological situation for animal health. And could you tell us a little bit more about your role? Okay, so detail? let's take um, the animal health situation. So when there are um, in the country um, breakouts of disease or um, any challenges with diseases that spread in any type of animal that we have uh, in the country. We at the ministry oversee um, the plans that are put in place and the emergency plans uh, to be able to quarantine these diseases, make sure the right local authorities are acting um, as appropriate, as well as informing the public. Um, from a live animal trade, uh, my office and my team uh, we regulate which countries we're allowed to import live animals from, depending on their disease status. So that's an international engagement, as well as regulating the veterinary practice. We license veterinarians in the country. Um, we ensure that they're tested and have the appropriate credentials uh, to be able to practice in the country. We also regulate the veterinary medicines, as well as oversee the committees uh, that um, review any complaints or concerns that come to the ministry. So from from a big picture, I belong part of the, uh, the department is part of the food diversity sector. Mm -hmm. So this is the sector that oversees all of agriculture and food production. And how did you get into veterinary medicine? So um, I was fortunate enough to fall in love with biology in the third grade. Um, I'm, I, I've, I think I've pinned it down to one very simple diagram, which was the food web. And then that took me through to my last years of school where I was trying to figure out what I would do as a profession. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a family friend um, who is the director of a research laboratory here in Dubai. Uh, it's the Central Veterinary Research Laboratory. Um, and I spent a summer, it was about two months, doing pathology and working in the labs, in the parasitology lab. And I, I first in, engaged there as for the love of biology. I was picking each discipline, thinking, should I become a parasitologist? Should I study hematology? And then the director turned around and said, why don't you become a veterinarian? Because then you'll do all of them. And I was thinking, wow, I'd never thought of myself as being able to become a doctor of anything, <laughs> let alone think there was a science that had all this covered. Um, a little intimidated, but um, he took me under his wing and then I applied and I worked hard to get in. I didn't have all the grades I needed. Oh No, no, I, I was doing biology, but I didn't have any other science. So I went back to school, wow. did my A-levels again uh, in a year while I was in the UK, got into vet school there and it was like uphill until I graduated. Uh, and then I was a veterinarian. Well, that's an excellent story because I know in addition to being a veterinarian, you're also a drummer. Yes, <laughs> that's what I do. So uh, that 
also comes from a love of music. Um, my, just to give you some background, my brothers and I, we all grew up as having a nice um, balanced, uh, as we like to call it, a balanced education. Mm -hmm. So we all had our subject matter expertise, whether it was a science or a social science. We also played a sport, so we were physically active, and we all had our creative interest as well. And for me, my art was music. Um, and all my brothers play instruments. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we all picked our disciplines. And uh, I've been fortunate to play in a few bands, some of them big and famous now. <laughs> really? So, yeah. Remind us to get your autograph later. Yeah, yeah no worries. <laughs> if, if anybody's a fan of Asking Alexandria, I started the band here. There we go, Asking <laughs> Alexandria. <laughs> Our producer over here is making yeah. like, oh, so this I'm is nodding, awesome. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a story for another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you are also a keen carpenter. Yeah, a woodworker, I would call it. Um, so I that came out of the... The part of my career where I moved out of clinical practice, um, I used to be in the field and you work with your hands. It's part of what I loved about being a veterinarian, problem solving. And then when I was when I was asked to become director at the Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi, um, I realized that I was now at a desk. I was working with teams, but I my hands weren't busy. And there's part of me that enjoys mm -hmm. you know growing up with Lego. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to find more Lego type <laughs> stuff to do. Um, so I, I spent one summer with my wife traveling around Europe and, um, I'd actually learned that my grandfather, who's a big inspiration from my mom's side, German mm -hmm. side of the family, um, was getting ill. Um, and he was like the super handyman. Um, and I was very much like him. I always fixed the stuff around the house and, you know, if a c door cupboard wasn't working, I was... Well, that's uh, handy. Yeah, exactly. A cupboard door wasn't working. I'd be the one to fix it. And then I realized I was going to lose out, you know, learning from him. And in my mind at first, I was like, oh, I'll spend all summer with him. Then I realized it was impractical. But I thought, okay, let's get into really working, you know, with your hands in mm -hmm. that sense. And I realized uh, both my wife and I are very much into wood as a medium in the home and... Yeah, before you knew it, I was YouTubing 24-7, and there is some really good resources out there. And yes. I got hooked. Yes, I, I followed you on, on Instagram in, in that phase when you were yeah. buying new machines yeah. and <laughs> practicing and experiencing. You'll know that there's the been a hiatus, but I've been secretly <laughs> building my home workshop. So we're almost we're almost back on schedule. Well, I just well, need I'm to carve to out hear that. Hour. I'm happy to hear that. Also, earlier you were telling me about how you are encouraging your children yes. uh, to go gardening. Tell us yeah. their ages again. So so uh, my eldest, Sultan, mm -hmm. is four years old. Khaled is three. And my youngest, Lubna, she's a year and a half. Okay. Um, and really being outdoors, um, that's really me finally coming full circle to where I was with my dad. So when I was their age, he used to walk every morning in the garden and he would review mm -hmm. how all the plants are growing and be working with the groundsman that we had to say, okay, this needs to be changed. Sometimes he'd be on the weekend planting crop as well and I would be with him. And ultimately, I realized more and more as my expertise in veterinary medicine sort of grew into really a love for agriculture, mm -hmm. um, I found myself in my dad's shoes, so to speak, yes. and I realized, no, I need to have something at home. I need to be able to share something with my kids and give them the same experience because it was very valuable for me. Um, and so, yes, I'm in the garden now on the weekends, at least, if not sometime in the midweek with them trying to plant carrots and tomatoes and That's fantastic. making sure that they get their hands dirty. And, uh, it, it's funny when at first my wife was like, Oh my God, they're going to get there. And I was like, this is what little kids supposed to do. Like, yes. Yes. Yeah, so all dirty. of this leads me to my next question. Uh, you're very interdisciplinary yourself. What mm -hmm. do you think is the value of interdisciplinary education and experiences? Um, I love that you've asked me this simply because uh, I'm one that likes to cross-pollinate. Yes, um, the clearly. idea that you've got ideas in one discipline that can suddenly become relevant to another. So whether it's practically building things, um, using theory and music, uh, uh, the experience of, of working with people. And for me, I think just the idea of having a different perspective in many ways. So when you're playing music and you're doing improv, you have to understand and read people in the moment and understand where the music's going. 
when you're working um, with a medium such as wood, understanding the mm -hmm. grain, like falling back to, you know, organic material yes. as opposed to everything being engineered square and 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 right angled. Yes. Um, I think it's just given me a lot of appreciation for somebody else's point of view. Um, I can reach back into a big um, archive of information and knowledge. And I think something that people take for granted is also when I meet new people. I mean, I've literally sat across from sort of people leading think tanks or agencies, uh, international government agencies, and I'll, I'll know that they're into improv jazz. And I'm a drummer, and so I will just say, like, oh, by the way, I and suddenly that person and myself yes. have a, a lot more to bond over, yes. and very quickly working together becomes easier. There's a certain amount of respect and understanding mm -hmm. for each other, and you can get to results faster rather than be two strangers trying to work out a technical issue yes. and have no bearing or gauge as to how, how we operate. So um, part of it is knowledge or models or methods, mm -hmm. The other is really human connection. Yes. And lastly, also just to keep it fresh, just to keep things interesting. Yes, because um, we tend to, in education, put things in a box. Yeah. And oh, it's not really goodness. like that. Yeah, and, and from my own experience, we as human beings also like to think we're apart from the the situation or yeah. the environment, especially in the environment. We're always looking at it. We don't appreciate so much that we are part of it. So, Absolutely. yeah, in that sense, uh, cross-pollinating yeah. and interdisciplinary learning is important. Which I'm so happy you just said that because it just brings me to the next, next question. Why is it important to create a sustainable future? You just said we're part of the environment. Mm -hmm. and sustainability is very much mm -hmm. part of that discussion, has been for decades. So, Well, I, I, why is it important? I, I honestly think it's a funny question because... Well, if it isn't sustainable, then there isn't going to be one, and yes. then we're done. <laughs> like short or long term, I mean, it's anyone's guess how long that might be. But I believe our role on the earth is part of. I mean, like I said, my first love was the food web. We're yes. part of the food web. Yes. We're part of the environment, and um, as being the organism on this earth that has sort of managed much more than all the others in terms of changing and modifying the environment and extracting things mm -hmm. from the environment. I think we also have the responsibility as custodians of mm -hmm. that power, uh, to make a Spider-Man reference, <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility, but to be able to be good custodians of that power and that capability mm -hmm. and respect all the other organisms that we mm -hmm. share the earth with. Mm -hmm. So sustainability really mm -hmm. speaks to being able to find our way in this mm -hmm on this planet really um for continuous long-term you know prosperity yes you say it's a funny question but sometimes i feel some people have their hands on their ears going la 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 i don't la, think that la, many la, people la. have thought of it sometimes <laughs> but you know people talk about it and they use the buzzwords but mm -hmm. yeah to to really to be able to step back far mm -hmm. enough yeah. you know and realize they're part of the mm -hmm. the yeah, the solution and mm -hmm. part of the equation. So how can we do this more systematically? How can we use education and even thought leadership to promote a future of sustainability? I'm a big believer in education at an early age. Mm -hmm. So whether it's like I'm doing with my yeah, kids I was just gonna and say. Uh, you know, being in the garden, um, that part was also for me to explain to my children what it takes to grow a carrot, you know, what it takes to grow our food. I mean, there have been enough examples uh, that are, you know, really shocking where they say, you know, where does milk come from? And the kid responds from the supermarket. Yes. And not course. understanding where meat comes from and everything that we consume. Mm -hmm. And then to consume it responsibly, to understand what it takes to yes. for it to get so far to your plate. Yes. So I think that is, is, is part of um, building an awareness mm -hmm. of the togetherness or the interconnectivity of all things around them in the environment. Um, also, yeah, just building a natural curiosity. So if you've got children at an early age to be inquisitive about the world around them, physical, natural, or otherwise, mm -hmm. you, you're going to set that way of thinking early on so that it becomes useful and usable throughout yes. their life. So, um, one thing I was fortunate about having studied veterinary medicine was to understand that I'm actually going to be a student for life. 
and everybody should, but a lot of people assume that once they're done with yes. university, they do, don't do exams anymore. Well, actually, you don't do the learning for the exams. You do learning to increase your capacity and understanding your participation in the world. And to accomplish things, too. Exactly. So um, education is critical just to get the, the, the thinking right early on and just to be able to have that curiosity build and become a useful tool, just mm -hmm. to always be asking questions, mm -hmm. to be naturally curious, and to engage more with the world around them. Mm -hmm. And that's really going to be what drives you know, the sustainable world and the opportunities for solutions to our today and future mm -hmm. challenges. So staying around uh, the topic of nature and environment, how can we create an exciting future for humanity while at the same time respecting nature and the environment? I think this is the, this is the part that really makes me really sad is when people don't think it's already exciting, mm -hmm. right? Nature is when, I mean, part of what I do on social media sometimes is just film all the bugs in my garden. And I'm learning that there are more bugs in my garden than I thought and different types. And then there are some people that are fascinated. And I, and I usually turn around and say, like, go and take, spend some time in your garden and just take a good look. Mm -hmm. Take the time to not look at your phone and look at the world around you. There's so much of it right in front of our faces, That's but true. we're so busy running to our next meeting and, and, and the it's like. It's like a mini zoo in your garden, oh, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. if you take the Well, time. actually, it's a biotope slash microcosm. Like there it, you go. There are, there are small, <laughs> small <laughs> ecosystems in, in a puddle, mm -hmm. you, know, yes. uh, you know, around the corner. True, true. So if you take the time, if you really open your eyes, your ears, and sort of remove all those common day distractions, you'll find that it's super exciting. I mean, I've started composting now since oh, the fantastic. beginning of last year. And there's so much alive in there. It's amazing. Okay, so um, how did you manage to get the composting worms? I have no composting worms. Ah, I just, I, I'm not doing, I'm not doing um, a, a worm farm. <laughs> what I did was I just... I'm just accelerating the biology of breakdown of, of okay. the nutrients. So what I did was I just started throwing all the trimmings from our, our green matter, so like the vegetables yes. and the fruits, um, into a pile and then throwing some dry leaves on it. Uh -huh. And literally, like, without a plan, I'm like... I looked up a YouTube. It said, okay, you should do, you know, two to three ratio and or one to three ratio. And I'm like, okay, get started. And that was it. So cool. And then I'm just refining the process and learning. And I think... If I can, dip, you know, part one message here, get started. Don't overthink it. Like, make mistakes. Oh, my God. I've I spent too much time <laughs> overthinking what the garden should look like. And now if anybody asks me, how do I get started? I'm like, buy soil, buy a pot, put a seed in it, water it every day. You've started. Simple. Like, yeah. Yeah. And then from there you learn, you iterate, you observe that's it. So compost, uh -huh. find a place, <laughs> find a very simple, if you're in an apartment, find a small compost bin or something that you can use. Yes. If you're in a garden, find a small corner yes. and just get started. And this is going to be great for the garden you're building with your Yeah, kids. absolutely. That's part of the system. I'm trying to create a, a mini circular economy yeah, experiment at I home. So I'm, yeah, I'm doing that. Watch that space. Yeah, exactly. I'll, Please, I'll, I'll be sharing more social media. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know. I started, I started back with my garden updates uh, on Instagram. So, yeah, it's there. I look there. forward to following those. Cool. So tell us, um, you, you obviously work with animals. Yes. So whether professionally or personally, I'm sure animal welfare is important to yep. you. And um, why, basically? Mm -hmm. and, and how does a human progress also involve progress in ethics and rights involving animals. Okay, so you have to understand this goes back to one hour relationship with animals. And if you look at a food web, um, different animals consume different animals and we're part of that system. The problem or let's say the challenge with uh, industrialized food production, especially on the animal front, is that we have animals that are being and this was part of why I didn't become an agriculture veterinarian mm -hmm. early in my career. I didn't go straight into the farming practices mm -hmm. because I believe you have the demand of economics or yes. like the market to have cheaper milk, cheaper yes. eggs, cheaper meat. And that pressure was transferred right down to the animal yes. level. And between the, you know, the food producers and the market mm. pressures, the animals are carrying yes. the burden. Now, I think that comes from, I mean, we could 
digress into that. Yes. But I believe that if you have an animal that has very high welfare standards and has a, um, a quality of life mm -hmm. that um, is free of disease, stress, and can live out its natural behavior mm -hmm. until the time where it will be perhaps taken to for meat production or is producing milk or mm -hmm. eggs, you can have a high quality product that's nutritious. Mm -hmm. The challenge is um, with the way food is produced, a lot of those things are under pressure. Yes. And the problem is with yeah the increased wealth and the yes. opportunity in life, we want more of it, mm. and so we want it cheaper. And so from a society, I mean, here's a good example. Here in the United Arab Emirates, I speak to my grandmother and I ask her, like, what, what did you eat mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. on a daily basis? Well, she said, I got up and I had some dates. Mm -hmm. I had a fish for lunch mm -hmm. with my family. We had one fish. And then dinner was a cup of camel's milk. I was like, oh, you weren't eating meat? She's like, oh, my God, it was a real celebration yep. if we slaughtered a animal. Mm -hmm. And then we ate yes. everything. Yes. We're not doing this deep fried chicken or, <laughs> or these like T-bone steaks. No, no, no. And, and you realize there are people who are eating maybe like you know, three to four times a day a yes. meat product. That's true. It's, 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 a, it's a quick departure from yes. what we used to eat. Yes. Um, and that was more in line with our bodies. So part of that is us adjusting the way we eat and what we eat and also respecting the animals and really bringing back the value of what it takes to raise animals for consumption. And then the second part of your question as to why it's important, ethics and morals, really as custodians to the environment, mm -hmm. you know, you, if you're going to abuse other participants in the environment, in the ecosystem, yes. you cannot hope that this doesn't come right back yes. and, you know, bite you in the rear. Yes. And, and it's really about respecting the relationship. Um, very simple. If in a food web you have a carnivore overconsume its yes. prey, then the prey just it's drops an out of and an imbalance and you get an immediate feedback and suddenly yes. they can't feed themselves. They've yes. been overhunted or over predated. And yeah, and that's the way biology and nature works. Yes. And how do we address this? Like, what are some of the problems facing? our education system today and addressing this and, and others, other issues? Not a small question. Um, <laughs> I think if, if anything, in this day and age of so, so much information, I'm going to say we need more awareness. And that's quite a dif difficult ask when you have our attention being grabbed by a million other things. But the more awareness you can bring to the natural world, the challenges we have in it to, you know, call not only just it's not call to action. You just need people need to understand. I mean, most of the time, these decisions that are questionable or are, are not um, in line with, you know, custodianship of the environment is simply be it's simply ignorance. Yes. They don't know any better and nobody's told them. Mm -hmm. um, and so. That's why I tried to do as much you know, public engagement, yes. speaking, uh, you know, for the lack of doing one person at a time, uh, try as much to just share information without pointing at people and saying you're wrong, mm -hmm. but to say, look, there are other ways to do it. And these ways will allow us to enjoy these things for longer. Mm -hmm. And uh, through your experience, um have you been into schools? Do you know how open they are to change? Oh, I, I get invited to schools all the time. I think the challenge is I can't find the time to do all the school talks that I'd love to. And yes, there are some really good teachers, really good educators and, and, and deans and um, programs that exist in schools. The challenge is um, bringing that back into more of the basic education as opposed to it being this sort of tack on hey we do the sciences and we do mm -hmm. and and when i say the sciences i'm talking about like the pure sciences mm -hmm. um i was having an interesting conversation with somebody only uh, a couple a couple days ago about home economics okay um like home economics and being in the kitchen is the ultimate synergy of biology chemistry physics i'm so and glad you said that yeah well the idea is and and 
home economics. It's the it's the the family unit. It's where all people go to live and be most of their time. So, a science or a subject like that is should be the cornerstone of what we do, as opposed to and this is, I've seen this also in my education as a veterinarian. You you study all these sciences as sort of sector disciplines or silo disciplines, and then. You come to the last year and they're like, okay, well, synthesize all this. And you're going, what? You and there's, taught it. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> so there are certain, pro, you know, sort of project-based learning mm -hmm. and um, case-based learning. But I think this should be brought right back down to the mm -hmm. base level where you're learning all these parts of, I mean, back when I was in grade three, it was just called science. Right. Yeah, and uh, then it became biology and physics and chemistry. And you were working at all the different levels of the macro yes. and micro. But we could do more to synthesize, which goes yes. back to our cross-pollinating yes. and our yes. interdisciplinary learning. Yes. And so how can we get um, all the stakeholders to be inspired to make changes that lead to that kind of learning? Well, I think first and foremost, inspiring them is great, but I think what you need to do is also have them be okay with mistakes. Mm -hmm. The fear is when you're dealing with education and you know there are a hundred different ways to do it, um, I think there are a lot of people that are inspired. But the fear is of, you know, going against grain or doing something different. You set yourself outside of the group and then you feel, you know, vulnerable or you're not safe in that sense. So imagine a school that radically changes and says, you know what, we're going to do away with examination. Mm -hmm. yes. Everybody's like, well, how are, you, how are you going to ensure that these kids have learned enough? Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but it's taken some countries to be brave about how they do and change their education system. And then when they realized, well, everybody else realized, hey, you know what, the kids are okay. They turned out really bright and quite engaged and uh, they're fine. Yes. Maybe we could do it. So you need some pioneers. Uh -huh. You know, of those course. are the ones inspiring, but you need to be able to be brave and say, you know what, I want to try that too. And if it goes wrong, that's okay. okay. Right? And uh, have you seen uh, changes? Um, in schools or in teaching and learning? Well, for one, being a father now, um, I'm very curious and I'm, I feel, I'm, I'm very heavy into understanding how my children will be educated. And I've had my own beliefs as well challenged. Um, everything from, you know, I believe in this system versus that system to what if we homeschooled them? Mm -hmm. And what would, th what would that be? Would they lose out on cer so certain social interaction and then you realize, oh, actually, you know what? That might make them very independent. And and there are so many sides to consider. Ultimately, the one thing that I know is, as a father, I have a major role in their education yes. from a day to day. Yes. And it's not the school's responsibility. The school yes. facilitates education, but parents really need... And it's a challenge for those that have never... I mean, it, it can be overwhelming if you think that you have to teach them everything. It's not that. But to catalyze their education to ask them about what they're doing at school to learn with them um, to be curious about what they're learning and also in whatever opportunity you have in your own sense whether it's you know, you take them out fishing mm -hmm. or you're in the garden or when you walk you know you you all put your phones away and yes. you just have a conversation the the home unit the parents the family members have such critical role. But the assumption, I think, sometimes is, well, they go to school to learn, yes. and then we can just do our thing at home. Yes, it, it really makes me so happy to hear how you are so hands-on with the learning As much as I can kids. be, yes, yeah. That's really very, very heartwarming. And what changes would you like to see? I think something that's coming around the bend right now is um, understanding more about the empathy and the emotional quotient mm -hmm. as as people are being educated. Mm -hmm. um, I know I have a very high EQ mm -hmm. and it was never it was never taught to me or never identified mm -hmm. when I was at school that this was something to work with. I mean I was I was given certain recognition for things of being like the most well you know the most understanding student mm -hmm. and, but Nobody got to the root of that being, okay, you have a high EQ yes. and you're a very strong extrovert. And actually that's very good in bringing different parties together and mm -hmm. collaborating on projects. So how do we get you to strengthen that and take that forward? Mm -hmm. I'm actually only recently learning that I have the fortune of having a mom that's been very hands-on. And 
every five years, I used to, you know, as I was planning my career, I'd do a SWOT analysis about where I'm going, what do I do? And I looked back recently at that, and it's never changed, you know? I'm a very good public speaker. Um, I'm very engaged. Um, uh, I, I can, you know, communicate well. I'm horrible at administrative stuff. <laughs> and, and she always said, she's like, look, just outsource that. Like, do not try to, like, work and become very good at emails. It'll it'll cripple you yeah no and i know a lot of people are going yeah that's me too but <laughs> like your host <laughs> we, yeah there's there's a lot of people that have a lot of different strengths and natural ability and i think that needs to be highlighted early in the education system okay. to to understand what tracks and what possibilities they can leverage those strengths for down the line mm -hmm. um, rather than saying it's good at maths mm -hmm. yeah right yeah. it's it's okay why is he a strong introvert is she capable of intense focus mm -hmm. um you know how do you leverage that and pick mm -hmm. education streams or skill sets mm -hmm. for the future okay. um in that sense so um talk it's still talking about changes mm -hmm. how um involved are students in driving changes in if given learning? if given the chance to voice mm -hmm. themselves and i think that's changing i mean the the student body is becoming more part of how they manage their own education today than before. Before it was rote learning and yes. like this is what the textbook says and even the teacher was sort of blind yes. to, you know, what really was an interpretation. Um, today more and more, I love the, um, I can't remember which school it is, but where they choose their own, um, um, their sort of study stream mm -hmm. based on their natural curiosity. Yes. They'll also be looking at something and go, I wonder how that works. And the teacher's role then is to facilitate more information in that direction, mm -hmm. irrespective of what the class is doing. Okay. And to, to give the opportunity to seek knowledge mm -hmm. and, you know, internalize it and make it part of their mm -hmm. knowledge base, as opposed to, well, no, no, you have to turn to chapter three now, mm -hmm. and this is what we're going to do today. Yes, yes, that's uh, essentially what we did as well mm -hmm. at school growing up. Yeah. How else can we involve students more in taking their education in their own hands? Well, one, liberate them from the school. Understand that, like, <laughs> the school isn't the only place you can learn. And yes. the Internet is this sort of wide expanse of opportunity to learn. Um, there are some funny corners on the Internet. But if students understand and have the right access and really natural... I mean, there are some kids today that are learning things faster than I ever did mm -hmm. simply because they know how to navigate the web and they know how to, you know, engage with other students across yes. the globe. Um, so learning from others, learning from the internet and knowing that not everything's coming from a classroom Yes. and from a teacher. Yeah, absolutely. And would you say these are one of the obstacles and challenges in the way of making changes happen? And, and what are other obstacles and challenges in making changes happen? It really comes down to, um, you know, the parents being open to the idea that a student can can seek his own knowledge, mm -hmm. his or her own knowledge, just mm -hmm. where it might find itself. Back in the day, the really sort of knowledge-hungry student went to the library and spent yes. its weekend there. But the idea is that you could learn just as much on the football field or on the rugby field or in a, in a sports or in conversation with others. So to understand, as I think the challenge is parents need to know that everything can be a learning experience so long as it's um, sort of positioned that way. Um, and to ensure also that all those opportunities encourage learning. Yes. You know, so we played sports, we went to music class, we d and these were all, and I did martial arts, mm -hmm. but these were all different opportunities or disciplines mm -hmm to broaden my learning horizon. Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence. Yeah, there you go, yes. exactly. Yes. So um, I think the challenge is for those that don't understand that's possible, and it's an awareness thing again. So what should school curricula today focus on, and how can we make uh, curricula adaptable to meet the changing demands of society? I think um, what curricula and, and schools or any education institution should do today is focus on skill sets of the individual. And I'm not talking so much customized education, but to say, okay, understand that this person is a natural athlete. 
Yes. But how can this natural athlete gain access to the world of physiology or science or mathematics rather than say, well, they'll never be, they'll never be good at this mm-hmm. or to say, well, oh, you're an athlete, so you have to become a professional athlete. Well, no, I mean, they can mm-hmm. become a physio- mm-hmm. physiotherapist, they can yes. become a, a coach, they can become, and sort of understand the attributes of every student uh, as opportunities for their future mm-hmm. and streams. I mean, I, I did in my last two years of school a lot of sort of career testing mm-hmm. And what I liked, I was doing some German career testing systems. They weren't telling you these were your subjects. They were saying, oh, you have a natural aptitude to, you know, engaging with people. You like, you know, being outdoors. Yes. You like using your hands. Yes. And so I was picking, you know, my subjects mm-hmm. according to those skill sets. Mm-hmm. I think we need to start a lot earlier. Yes. Understand who in the group of students is the person who networks and yes. brings the different parties together. Uh, understand who in the group has the ability to create very deep, insightful research mm-hmm. um, and make it then accessible. Who Who is the marketer? Who translates <laughs> this deep research into yes. everyday, yes. you know, speak? Um, so I, I would I would I would say, if anything, the institutions need to know how to draw out the strengths of every student as opposed to put everybody in a class, blanket yes. it with a subject yes. or, or, or the class for the day and then gauge who's doing well and who's doing not so well so they need more time or right. more attention. That's, that's not what it is. As opposed to something different altogether. Exactly. Yes. I mean, the, the, it's sort of, if you will, the sort of the cut and slice of it needs to change the perspective or the scale by which you're measuring people. Yes. So moving from the changing demands of society mm-hmm. to living in exponential times, yes. how can we prepare our students for the future? Man, it's, I mean, with only 24 hours in a day and <laughs> only so much time for learning and access for information, we need really to be able to get The exercise I did was to remove the TV from the house. You removed the TV. Yeah. So that means when the TV is gone, the Netflix is gone. That means the PlayStation is gone. That means, and that was as much oh. for my kids as myself. Ah. <laughs> and, and that then meant I had more time to read, mm-hmm. more time to learn, more time to be in the garden. And it's, it's, it's kind of, it's about distractions. Yes, it is. I think the world can be very distracting, especially when there are, Tons of marketing ploys to get people to buy more stuff, right? With you on that one. So um, you know everybody can enjoy themselves. It's not to say that everybody needs to become a you know a, a gardener, a, a gardener. Yeah. <laughs> or a woodworker. But <laughs> I but I realize that there are enough crutches mm-hmm. that are you know like oh do you want to what do you want to do now oh you know what I'll just play for a bit on the PlayStation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this goes back to a, a sort of practice that I have, which is measuring your consumption versus production. Yes. So wh- how much are you consuming and how much are you producing? Yes. Uh, in the sense that are you consuming knowledge or are you consuming distraction. just distraction, <laughs> you know? Uh, and are you producing stuff? Are you playing music? Are you building things? Are you gardening? Are you putting back what you've learned into uh, the ecosystem, the environment, the community? Um, there are enough things that they've got you pegged to. Um, I mean, I find myself now that I, with what limited time I have, I cannot invest the hours into yes. binge watching a new series. Yes. Not to mention the emotional turmoil of some With of these shows, right? <laughs> so there's people like, oh, have you seen this new show? I'm like, actually, no. And I didn't even watch the last season of, you know, Game of Thrones. And everybody's like, you, you're crazy. No, we get, you haven't watched Game of Thrones? Yeah, well, Ex- you know. Exceedingly it, louder this, volume. Exactly. You haven't watched Game of, you know, <laughs> so we haven't <laughs> at all. It, it's, you know, it, it's just a matter of time. There's only so much. You have mm-hmm. one life. Yes. You know, you have one opportunity on the earth. There's so much out there that could make you uh, uh, a net contributor, mm-hmm. somebody who's engaged, somebody who is going to give back as much as you take. Yes. And the natural world is, is we still don't know, understand it all. Yes. So you can, you can get lost in that and, you know, yeah. 
I mean, it's just so beautiful hearing yeah. you say these things. I mean, I'm not a luddite. I'm for, yeah. I'm for technology. Obviously. Absolutely, it's, it's, it's catalyzing a, a lot of a things. Big social media, uh, yeah. social media presence, yeah. and you keep everyone engaged with you. But you, you're also very present in the physical world. Yeah, so I, I, really, there's really no, really to hear there's that. no, I, especially as somebody who's very much a people person, there's no substitute today for being present with a, another person. I mean we could go into the whole communicating without words kind of yes. you know stuff but um no i'm not a luddite either i believe technology when used correctly can really catalyze learning can expedite uh assimilation of knowledge but it can also be very distracting yes there's so many things beeping yes. and ringing yes. at, at yes. you all the time yes. never mind all this banners and i mean where i'm sat now know, there's so I much know. happening behind you and i'm just You're trying vocalizing to keep... so many of my daily thoughts yeah so um yeah i try as much as i can to be an educator yes. and uh, and a communicator that's yeah. really as much as i want to do but to inspire people to go and do their own learning i always like to end with the question what are you optimistic about? Oh, I'm optimistic about everything. I'm oh. like the super optimist. <laughs> like when, when, whether it's at work or anything and, and things look like they're going very far south and we're taking a nosedive, I'm like, great, what do we have to do to change things? Turn it around. And people are looking at me like, yeah, but it's crashing all around us. I'm like, yeah, but it means we should be doing something. We can act. So um, it's kind of a difficult question for me to answer because I'll just say everything. Um, I believe in the human potential. I believe, I mean, we've gotten this far and I believe we can turn it around no matter where we are. The idea is just to be able to create enough critical mass, mm -hmm. um, get enough people around the table as we're sat here. Yes, it's not just you doing. and I. Yes. Um, and in that sense of cross pollinating, I'm moving in a lot of different circles. Yes. So always talking about what I'm passionate about. And I, I've done a number of sort of business related public speaking events where people will come to me and they have something that has no sort of immediate relevance to growing your own food mm -hmm. or the environment but they're passionate about it and mm -hmm. they say how can what we do contribute to that and then what's nice is i get the opportunity to sort of string what they're doing to what i'm doing and they immediately go okay how do i get started so i'm really tempted to write a couple books about being able to make this you know sort of very concise way pick this up and act um, well i think that if anyone can do it you can you're such an interdisciplinary gotta find person. The, the hours but yes, i will i will yes. do it believe I, me i think you absolutely can thank you dr magic it has been such a pleasure, Laura, pleasure having you on the podcast today thank you for joining us thank you